Hello and welcome to your weekly five minutes of intercourse with Dr. Don. Because we all need to talk at least a little about sex. Last week, we educated ourselves about the roots of sex, gender, and orientation by successfully building a human organism. Let's spend this week's five minutes of intercourse analyzing what conclusions can be drawn from last week's building project. To quickly review last week's intercourse, we put 10 ingredients together to build our human. In chronological order, these 10 ingredients were sex chromosomes, gonads, sex hormones, internal sex organs, sex gender and orientation on the brain, external sex organs, birth sex, gender roles, gender identity and expression, and sexual orientation. At this point, if you haven't seen last week's video, you're probably pretty curious about the details and the relative amounts of each one of these ingredients. I don't have time this week to expand upon the ingredients. You'll have to go back to last week's video for that. However, if you'll allow me, I'd like to add one last ingredient to our recipe of being human. This last ingredient is sexual fluidity. In the past, us humans have intentionally ignored sexual fluidity as one of the ingredients making us who we are. We've done this by forcing ourselves into rigid and unnatural sex, gender, and orientation categories. Are you a man or a woman? Check the box. Are you feminine or masculine? Check the box. Are you homosexual or heterosexual? Check the box. Recent studies, like ones conducted within my laboratory, have questioned if our sexes, genders, and orientations are naturally fluid when removed from their constrictive boxes. In these studies, we ask people to identify their sexes, genders, and orientations in the traditional two-category scale. And then we ask them to identify their sexes, genders, and orientations within a continuum. If people view their sexes, genders, and orientations as occurring in only two categories, then they likely will answer in the same fashion no matter the scale, by answering using the extremes of the continuums. If, however, people view their sexes, genders, and orientations as continuums, then they likely will identify themselves within the continuums and not just on the extremes. So how do people best identify their sexes, genders, and orientations? 18% of people best identify their biological sexes within a continuum. 40% of people best identify their sexual orientations within a continuum. And 55% of people best identify their genders within a continuum. The implications of these results are simple. Forcing people to identify their sexes, genders, and orientations on two categories is between 18 and 55% less accurate than allowing people to naturally identify themselves on a continuum. When we take into account the 11th ingredient of sexual fluidity, along with the 10 ingredients from last week's Human Building Project, three conclusions about sex, gender, and orientation become obvious. Conclusion number one. Sex, gender, and orientation are determined by biological and psychological and sociological factors. Genetic, intentional, and societal factors all play significant roles in determining sex, gender, and orientation. The combination of biology, psychology, and sociology determines our sex, gender, and orientation. 
Questions about whether someone's orientation is only biologically based, or whether someone's gender is only psychologically based, or whether someone's sex is only sociologically based, are silly and moot. Conclusion number two. Sex, gender, and orientation are independent of one another. Sex, gender, and orientation are certainly related to one another. But biological sex does not cause gender, nor does gender cause orientation, nor does orientation cause gender, and nor does gender cause sex. And gender nonconformity is associated with homosexuality but it's far from a causal factor. For example, a recent study testing shape differences between the faces of heterosexual and homosexual men made this clear when they found homosexual men's faces were rated as being significantly more masculine than heterosexual men's faces. Lastly, a homosexual male may fit the cultural stereotypes of being overly feminine but so too might he be masculine. Just as the heterosexual female might fit the cultural stereotypes of being feminine, so too might she be masculine. If the only thing you know about a person is their sex or their gender or their orientation, don't be fooled into believing you can predict the person's other two characteristics based solely on this information. Conclusion number three, sex, gender, and orientation vary on a continuum. Much the same way physical characteristics like height, weight, or your shoe size vary on continuums, so too does sex, gender, and orientation. And as ridiculous as it would be for there to be only two, three, five, or even ten different shoe sizes, so too would it be ridiculous for there to be only two, five, nine, seventeen, or even fifty different sexes, genders, or orientations. And if you'll allow me to take this analogy one step further, just as a shoe size of nine is no more normal or abnormal than a shoe size of 10 and a half or 12. Any one sex, gender, or orientation is no more normal or abnormal than any other. In fact, variations of sex, gender, and orientation occur throughout the animal kingdom, including humans, more than 65,000 animal species are intersexual and more than 500 animal species have homosexual or bisexual orientations. And the foremost international scientific and medical-based organizations recognize variations of sex, gender, and orientation as being normal. By stating these conclusions and scientific facts, I wish I could put to rest arguments of normality when it comes to sex, gender, and orientation. However, I'm not so naive to believe this will be the case. So instead of inciting arguments only capable of reaching false conclusions about people being categorically normal or not, let me end this week's intercourse with a promise and a question. And on time if it was four minutes ago. From this day forward, I promise to insightfully examine the extensive variations of biological sexes, genders, and sexual orientations that make us all human. The question I'd like to leave with you is based upon a quote from my favorite human sexuality educator, Alfred Kinsey. Only the human mind invents categories and tries to force facts into separated pigeonholes. The living world is a continuum in each and every one of its aspects. The sooner we learn this concerning human sexual behavior, 
the sooner we shall reach a sound understanding of the realities of sex. How soon will you be learning this about your sexuality? Thanks for watching. If you could rate this video, I'd appreciate it. Like us on Facebook at 5MI Weekly and follow us on Twitter. If you have suggestions about intercourse topics, then leave your ideas in the comment section or send those suggestions on Twitter to at 5MI underscore weekly using the hashtag 5MI topics. If I use your ideas for an intercourse, then I promise I'll be sending you a free copy of Being, my book on happiness.